Okay. <clears throat> All right, so Talofa and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, where, wherever you're tuning in from. So my name is Miranetta Williams and I am the Knowledge Manager here at SPREP. I'm very pleased to welcome you all to our staff seminar for October. This is a series of seminars that we have every month since 2014 here at SPREP. Um, it is mainly for our staff, by our staff only, to share knowledge on any topic of interest. However, since the start of COVID-19, we had to be innovative in ways to reach out to our other staff members who are also dialing in from overseas, as well as those that are connecting in from their homes. Um, but we have a few exceptions today. I think um, we have here with us um, the Marine team from the Samoa Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment, as well as a few members of the INFORM um, project team from various uh, locations around the Pacific. So, talofa to you all. So, um, this is the first time that we've uh, invited speakers from um, outside SPREP and connecting them virtually on Zoom. So, please, you know, with technology, Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So please bear with us um, if we encounter any hiccups with our technology today. Um, so before we go any further, it is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speakers for today. So um, we have Brianna Bambik. So Brianna manages the um, the field engagement team for the Allen uh, Coral Atlas at the National Geographic Society. So with a coral reef restoration background, she was an independent researcher for seven years that culminated in a virtual reality experience of Half Moon Cay National Monument in Belize with a National Geographic Explorer grant, helping to communicate science to the public. Brianna received her uh, Master's in Natural Resource Management from the University of Aguari, Iceland. Her expertise includes coastal and marine management, community engagement, and outreach. Um, we have Zoe Liev. Zoe is the project uh, coordinator on the field engagement team for the Allen Coral Atlas. Coming from a conservation biology background, she was the in-country manager and primary investigator for the Mongolian Bangkok Dog Project for two years, working towards culturally oriented solutions to human wildlife conflict issues among nomadic herding communities. She has also worked as a marine observer, collecting management data for Alaskan crab fisheries and other data collection positions. She received her master's in conservation biology from the University of Kent in the United Kingdom in 2019. Her expertise includes program development, quantitative and qualitative analysis and community supported conservation strategies. Um, we also have here today with us is Dr. Patrick Smallhorn West, who is dialing in from Australia. <laughs> but um, I'll hand it over to Brianna or Zoe to introduce him to you all. Thank you. Great. Yes, Patrick recently completed his PhD at James Cook University with the focus on coral reef ecosystems of the King, kingdom, of, kingdom of Tonga. We encourage you to check out some of his recent publications that cover topics including coral reef conservation, community-based management, and impact evaluation in the South Pacific. So we're really excited to have him join us and tell you a little bit about his work and a little bit about um, how that can be applied. All right, thank you. So um, I'll now hand it over to my colleague, Lupe Silulu, for a few housekeeping rules, and then we will proceed with our presentations. Thank you, Lupe. Hello, everyone. 
Can you hear me fine? Uh, for housekeeping, just a little on, please do not rename yourselves to nicknames as we will be tr keep, keeping track of participants and renew name, remove names that are not on the participant list for security reasons. Always mute your microphone to help keep the background noise to a minimum. Please raise your hand by clicking the hand button and unmute your microphone only when you need to speak. There will be a time for question and answers at the end of all presentations. However, you can use the chat feature to post questions and comments at any point of time during the seminar. A recording of today's seminar will be shared out to you all afterwards. Thank you. All righty. Thank you, Lupe. So over to you now, Brianna and Zoe and Patrick. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Mira. And also thank you, Julie Calabo, because it wouldn't, if it was, if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be here. So thanks for the invitation to present to the SPREP community. We're very intrigued at what you guys are working on and all the, the amazing community that you guys have. And we're happy to share about the Allen Coral Atlas, a new tool for coral conservation. And we hope this coincides with your island and ocean ecosystems, as well as your environmental governance work. So again, I'm Brianna Bambic, uh, leading the field engagement team, and I'm joined by my colleague Zoe Lieb, but I'm also happy to introduce uh, Dr. Chris Rolsema might be on the phone with us, uh, the head of the mapping team from the University of Queensland. So if you have any questions, uh, he can help answer them in the chat throughout the presentation. We also are joined by Patrick, which I introduce you. He's a reef researcher from James Cook University, and he's also a National Geographic Explorer. So we, um, we'll, we'll get to his presentation shortly as well. We invite you to join us at the AllenCoreAtlas.org, and you can follow along when Zoe gives a demo later in the presentation. So that's the opening page. So overall, we hope this presentation increases the understanding of what the Atlas is, um, who's involved, how the Atlas is made, its capabilities as well as its limitations, and how it may be applied to the conservation and planning efforts that you guys are working on in the South Pacific. So on top of the people here today, uh, we have a really diverse team. The co this co-author list is just a subset of all everyone working on the Atlas, which is funded primarily by Vulcan Inc., which was funded by Paul G. Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft. So Paul Allen passed away in October 2018, but the partnership thrives through coral reef scientists, universities, and NGOs and private entities building on his quest to help coral reefs and the vision of Dr. Ruth Gates, some of you guys might have met her, the renowned coral reef scientist and communicator, who also passed away in October 2018. So our project certainly stands on their shoulders. Our collective wish is to collaborate closely with organizations such as SPREP to make sure the Allen Coral Atlas is useful for your coral conservation and management goals. So the Atlas has mission is twofold. To create the world's first global mosaic of coral reef habitats based on a 3.7 meter resolution satellite imagery like you see here, and also to create a dynamic monitoring layer for bleaching and turbidity. And we expect that the global coverage will be completed by 2021. And as we are all a part of this coral reef conservation world, we understand that coral reefs are the most biodiverse and threatened ecosystems on the planet. However, even with over 500 million people depending on reefs for food, storm protection, and tourism income worth 30 billion annually, coral reefs are still largely unmapped. While many countries and regions have undertaken their own mapping projects, there is still no globally consistent map of coral benthic habitats. So why haven't they been mapped? Why is mapping coral reefs so complicated? Well, Darwin was apparently the first person to start mapping the world's coral reefs by hand in the early 1800s. Back then and still today, mapping submerged habitats is, is challenging because it is hard to see through that water, the surface. And it's difficult to map a big area quickly. So the Atlas has taken on these two challenges by creating new satellite imagery processes, machine learning, 
and image-based analysis to tackle the obstacles of global consistency. So we're using Heron Reef here in Australia as an example. This imagery is from the Dove satellites used by the Atlas. In the top left corner, you're able to see the actual island and the rest of the surrounding reef. Here you can see an incredible level of detail. Now compare this image to the next image. As you see here, until the Atlas, this is the best current global map. It is the UNEP WCMC's extent of reef systems based on lower resolution Landsat data. Maybe some of you are familiar with these maps. Um, you can see that there, there was past limitations allowed for only three distinguished classes, which was reef, non-reef, and island. So now if you compare that to the Atlas Benthic maps, they're able to provide a little bit more detail and, and accuracy with each color representing a different benthic feature. You can see here the coral algae layer, you have a microalgal maps, mats, you have rock, rubble, and seagrass, which are all really important benthic characteristics. And there's also the first ever global geomorphic map layer. The Atlas condenses dozens of different reef categories from all over the world and condenses them to 12 consistent geomorphic classes. Having consistent global coverage will allow for large scale conservation projects and coral reef management. So Zoe will go into more detail on these classifications shortly. One last tool that we're working on is the capability to have a near real time dynamic map of bleaching events and detection of turbidity which might look something like this heat map on the top right. The brightening and turbidity levels are detected by changes on the actual reef or in the water column. Rather than being based on a sea surface temperature like NOAA's bleaching alert systems, this map is on a much higher resolution at five meters. We plan to release an initial version of this product by the end of this year, so stay tuned, and we are interested in hearing how monitoring may be used in your region. So now that you can see why we're making maps and what we have to offer, let's move on to how the Atlas is made and we'll dip our hands into a demo shortly. Over to you, Zoe. Thanks, Bree. Uh, that was great. Um, so as you heard a little bit already, the Atlas is composed of a partnership that brings diverse skills and resources to the project. Um, Planet provides the high resolution satellite imagery from its fleet of over 180 Dove nanosatellites. Um, next, Arizona State University processes and prepares the images for mapping. They're able to basically uh, peel back uh, the sea water to see the shallow reefs more clearly. So as Brianna described, lots of influences in the water makes it difficult to see the bottom. Arizona State University helps correct that. Um, unlike on land, there are a number of visual elements that are going to obscure those images. Um, so that's why this processing step is really important. The Arizona State University team is also working on the technology for those monitoring features that are coming later this year. Once that imagery is processed, uh, we're going to move on to the mappers at University of Queensland who actually generate the maps. Uh, University of Queensland's Remote Sensing Research Center uses the process imagery plus an extensive collection of new and existing data provided by field teams and marine experts like yourselves to generate the benthic and geomorphic maps. It's a very important stage, of course, having that field data be integrated. Um, to take a closer look at the mapping layers that Brianna just showed us, um, this image here shows us the 12 mapping classes for the geomorphic layer that the Atlas uses to classify every shallow tropical coral reef in the world. The University of Queensland mapping team creates the geomorphic layer from satellite-derived bathymetry data, slope angle, and wave action data. So this allows the team to characterize the underlying uh, geological landscape beneath the shallow coastal areas. The benthic, map, uh, the benthic map layer characterizes the different bottom types. So new and existing data um, are needed to generate these, accurate, these maps accurately. Here we see just one of the ways um, the data can be collected for this a diver or snorkel, snorkeler can swim along a transect with a GPS unit uh, above them at the surface 
uh, and a plumb bob attached to their camera to create a one meter by one meter dimension for the photograph. Um, and especially with COVID, uh, you know, that makes it a lot more difficult for us to work with field teams to actually go and collect new data. So that means that existing data becomes much more important to our mapping process. Um, maybe some of you in SPREP have already heard from us about this, but if anyone has georeferenced data of shallow coastal habitats uh, available to share with us, or you know of publications that would be valuable, please let us know. Um, especially if you have a location for data in mind, you're welcome to write in the chat box now to let us know um, what locations you, you might have available data. I can pause for a moment to give everyone a chance to maybe write us a message or give us some ideas for that. Um, and optimally, we're looking for georeference benthic data uh, that's no deeper than 20 meters. So between 10 and 20 meters is probably the maximum depth that we can use. Uh, and we're also happy to answer questions at the end about what types of data are um, possible for us to integrate. So to create the benthic layer, the mapping team utilizes this data to train a machine learning algorithm. Um, and so that is paired with object-based analysis as well as manually generated reference samples. And essentially the machine learning algorithm is trained to identify what characteristics are associated with certain classes. So what it sees in the satellite image, it can determine what uh, actual bottom type is being indicated by that uh, spectral signature. Um, this process enables the maps to be created on a global scale with relative speed and accuracy. Once the maps are finalized through these different parts of the partnership, Vulcan Inc. shares the maps and other tools on the freely accessible website. That's ellencoralatlas.org that we mentioned previously. Um, new regions and new features will be added periodically throughout the development of the Atlas. And as we improve the usability based on feedback from those who are actually using the Atlas, those updates will, will go live as we move along in our mapping regions. At the end of this process, um, between the processing of the satellite images, generating the maps, making them accessible, of course, the ultimate goal is for the Atlas to contribute to conservation impact. And that is where the field engagement team comes in. It's our role to engage with those who study, manage, or create policy about coral reefs, both to enhance the usability of the Atlas by receiving and um, integrating feedback, and to provide resources to practitioners uh, such as yourselves so that they can effectively take up the tool and apply it to their work. Now that you know a little about how the Atlas is made, I'm going to pass it back to Brianna to go into some advantages and limitations to consider when you're planning to work with the Atlas within your organization. Thanks, Zoe. And feel free to write in the chat bar if anyone has any questions along the way. I'm going to highlight um, these three advantages of the Atlas are the fact that it's a, on a global scale, we have high resolution, and it's a free and accessible it's free and accessible um, to the wider public. So first of all, the Atlas is at a global scale and uses consistent mapping approach, which we mentioned a couple times. So you're able to compare region by region. Um, so you can see the highlighted region is the map aims to cover 30 degrees north and south of the equator, essentially covering all global tropical shallow reefs. So since the Atlas is the first of its kind, it serves a major gap for spatial data in many data challenge places around the world. Here, Zhao Lun of Fauna and Flora International Myanmar expresses how useful these maps for, were for his country. These maps are very important to our country as we have a data gap and need more information for our marine spatial plan. Sorry, just a moment. Thank you. 
Sorry, I had a minor glitch there. Just a second. Um, so we're going to pick up with the next advantage, which is the corrected high resolution satellite imagery. It, as you see here, it provides a seamless mosaic. You might ask, what about Google Earth? Well, Google Earth is an amazing tool for sure, but it's not a seamless mosaic. So you can see here on the left that part of the reef is missing, whereas the atlas imagery on the right is clear. You can see the waves and water are peeled back for a bird's eye view. So this is Coco Island in Myanmar, where Wildlife Conservation Society was planning an expedition to locate unknown coral reefs reported by fishers. WCS were very pleased to see how clear our imagery was compared to Google Earth to better target their expedition. So the third advantage is the data is completely free and accessible, which I mentioned, and the ability to download the data is now available. So Zoe will go through that shortly. Before I hand it over though, I wanna note a couple limitations um, to keep in mind. So first, um, here you have the cross section of the reef. The Atlas has a bathymetry barrier of mapping reef down to 10 meters and the benthic of the benthic layer and 15 meters for the geomorphic layer. This is due to capabilities of the Dove satellites to penetrate the seawater. Second, the Atlas has a biological constraint. Right now, the satellite imagery is unable to distinguish coral from algae, and we know that could be a concern, but as you see from this graph, the coral and algae have very similar spectral signatures or color signatures. So we see this as a combined benthic class as a coral reef real estate, where coral, live or dead, could live. And then next, um, the Atlas, Atlas is a static map. So many people ask if we'll be able to update and annually, and, and in theory, this is possible. Um, so we do appreciate feedback, but because once the algorithms are created, it is easier to redo, but the maps will, that will depend on future funding. Right now, the Owl and Coral Atlas Habitats maps represent the current distribution of coral reefs from 2018 to 2021, as seen from space. Um, so one of the last, the next things I'd like to point out is that there's uh, the new brightening layer, which is a proxy for bleaching and turbidities. This is a dynamic tool that will detect change over time. So these will be powerful monitoring tools that do have a temporal component and will allow you to see areas that may be experiencing changing conditions due to brightening of benthic substrates and turbidity in the wall, water column. And lastly, there's a spatial constraint. And this deals with the resolution of size or pixel. The map has a, approximately a five meter resolution. And compared to the 80 meter resolution of Millennium maps, this is an incredible improvement. Um, however, the satellites are still not able to distinguish between coral heads and health. Um, as you see in the bottom, subsurface surveys would be able to distinguish coral heads. But while techni technology like this and like global air born observatory or aerial surveys are potentially more accurate and high resolution, using satellite data has a better cost benefit analysis and it allows for regional and wide scale projects. Keep in mind that the local accuracy is limited, but on a large scale, say the entire Fijian Lao seascape, relative accuracy and access to baseline data possibly improves these data gaps and help build a more efficient management system. So those are a little advantage limitations. I'm gonna hand it back over to Zoe for a demo. But um, before, before we go, we'd like to know what mapping products are you currently using? Can you write in the chat bar right now, whether it's Google Earth, whether it's a WCMC map, we'd love to hear from you. So let us know in the chat bar now. Awesome, thanks, Bree. That'll give me a moment to get myself ready for the demo. And hopefully everyone can still see my screen all right. Okay, fantastic. 
Okay, just getting myself my <laughs> myself ready for the demo. <laughs> Great, awesome. Thanks so much for that um, that advantages and limitations, Bree. That's awesome. Now that we're up to speed about what the Atlas is and how it's made, I'm going to go into a short tutorial about some of the key features of the website. Also, before we jump in, um, a big thank you to, uh, to Julie uh, Calibo uh, and Sprep for including the Atlas on your website resources um, in your resource portal. We hope everyone can make use of the maps in their areas of interest. So you can check us out on that portal or you can go to alancoralatlas.org. Um, I'm gonna start on this main page here. You're welcome to open your own web browser and try to follow along. Um, and of course, check it out afterwards as well. It's important to start by signing up. By making a free login, uh, you are gonna be able to access a lot more features on the Atlas, like the download feature, the My Areas Saved feature, and many others. So I definitely recommend it, and it is free. We'll open the Atlas to actually get to the view here. Great, and I'm gonna start by turning on the satellite reef imagery. And right away, you can see those parts of the map light up. We've also included um, layers from NOAA Coral Reef Watch um, here in the Atlas as a, as a handy reference. And actually soon these are going to have a time series available. And already you can see the, the bleaching alert and a few other data layers that you're welcome to explore. Um, so we can look at an area of interest. I'm going to pick an island in Fiji, but you can go to whichever location you'd like to try this out. Um, so I'm going to go to uh, Katavu Island in Fiji, and I can click on it like this, and it'll bring you there. And it looks like I left all my polygon, so I can just... As you saw in some of Brianna's comparisons, the imagery can be much clearer than other unprocessed satellite imagery, such as on Google Earth. So those tools can still be really helpful, but this is definitely kind of a, a different type of view. I'm just gonna make sure we don't have any. Oh, great, cool. Um, and I'm gonna turn on the legend. So this legend will populate with the data layers that I turn on, and I'll turn on the benthic map. And so then in the legend, you see those classes that Brianna described previously. And in the panel here, if I open up this panel, um, let's say you only want to take a look at the seagrass in this area. You can just deselect all the other classes. And then you're just left with the class that you're most curious about. And that can be done for both, um, both data layers. Um, I will just mention the coral algae layer, as Brianna already pointed out, it can be a little bit confusing, but because those spectral signatures can't be distinguished, uh, we're viewing this as a more of a coral reef real estate indicator. Um, and I will switch over to geomorphic so you can have a, a look at that. Great. So to highlight an area of interest, that's where we're gonna use our polygon tool. I'm going to zoom in a little bit closer. And then you select the polygon tool from this right side panel here. First, I'll close my legend. And then you can just outline the area that you're interested in generating, generating an analysis for. Maybe I want to go all the way out to the edge of that reef. And then double click on the last point. This will pull up a stats analysis. And so this is just a basic breakdown of the two, um, the two data layers. So you can see kind of the coverage of each layer. This can be saved. So I'll just call this Kadavu PG for now. Hit save. And then that generates, that puts this solid line around it. And I can revisit it in my areas in this drop down bar here. Um, when you save an area, it's going to appear in this list. And then um, if you want to return to that stats card, you can select the, um, this little analysis tool here. And that'll pull up your stats card again. Um, you can also uh, toggle on and off the boundary area. Maybe you don't want that polygon visible. And in this section, um, 
you can uh, also download your, um, here, sorry, I'll uh, return to this. There's also an option to, you can also edit that area with the coordinates and you can also download that boundary from this section here. Let's take a look at the download feature um, as this is where you can access the, um, the Atlas data to use on other platforms. So you can get a shape file and open it on GIS or another platform. You might have noticed there are a few ways to get to the download section. Um, if I want to download for this area that I've selected, uh, I can just select this button here. They will pull up the download tab. And if you're already in the stats tab, of course, you can just navigate to it this way. And here you select the layers that you're interested in downloading. You have the option of the satellite reef imagery, the benthic layer, and the geomorphic. And of course, select that you agree to the, term, the license terms. When you hit prepare download, this is going to send um, the download package to the email address associated with your account. Uh, depending on the size of the area that you've selected, it might take a bit longer. So give it a few minutes before checking your email. Um, perhaps you already have a specific area of interest that you want to view on the atlas, like you already know your boundary. Um, you can scroll down in my areas and select upload a GeoJSON. And then you can simply select the, <laughs> select the file that you're interested in checking out. And that will also just get pulled up on the atlas. So perhaps you have a GeoJSON and you want to do a data download. You can just save this, this um, I'll call this MPA1, and then you can download the shape file from here. Yeah, this will take a moment to load, but I can just get rid of it for now. Um, also bear in mind, the Atlas is a new and developing tool. So we always encourage feedback and maybe some of you have already provided us feedback in the past. Um, it's super helpful to us. So you can find this little feedback prompt. Uh, this feedback prompt. Um, if you see an area that has a mapping issue, you can copy the URL where you're looking at that issue and you can send it to us at corrections at alancoralatlas.org with that URL, which is specific to that view. Uh, and just a brief description of what you see as the issue. We can't always resolve um, every issue that gets reported as some localized errors uh, and discrepancies are likely to occur, but knowing about such issues can help us improve the automated mapping process, especially if they're seen in a pattern, um, and that can help us uh, with future updates and for subsequent regions. Checking out the menu bar at the top, we do have a blog section that we encourage you to take a look at. Um, and you can also go to the science methods section if you want more information about the methodology behind the atlas. And the field engagement tab has additional resources, um, other information and tutorial videos uh, that you can check out that might come in handy uh, for specific questions. Um, I also just wanna point out, you can find the definitions of the mapping classes by selecting um, the I next to the classes, and this will bring you to a PDF description of those class definitions. Uh, also, I forgot to point out in the beginning, but the Atlas is available on the uh, Pacific Environment Portal. So I'm assuming some of you, most of you are probably already familiar with the portal, but you can find us here as well. So thanks so much for following along in this demo. Uh, hopefully everyone's ready to check it out for themselves. Um, next, we're going to go into some of the ways that the Atlas is already having an impact on coral reef research, management, and conservation with Patrick Smallhorn West. Um, so, we already gave you guys a, a brief description of, of Patrick. Um, he's recently completed his PhD at James Cook University, and um, just he's producing some really awesome um, papers and reports, and he's got a lot more exciting information to tell you about. So, I'm just going to stop sharing this for a moment and switch back over. <laughs> Speaking of technical difficulties, here we go. Thanks for all the questions coming through the chat. They're, they're really awesome. And thanks, Chris, for responding too. Awesome. Great. And sorry, I'm just going to move to And Patrick, whenever you're ready, you can take it away. OK, thanks, Zoe. Hi, everyone. Um, Really nice to meet you all. Um, I've been following 
uh, all of your work at Strat for a long time now, so it's good to, to uh, meet you in person. <laughs> um, so I moved to Tonga uh, in 2016. Uh, uh, ABI program, the Australian Volunteers for International Development. And I've been working uh, with the Tongan Ministry of Fisheries predominantly and also the Ministry of Environment um, for the past four years. Uh, we had to move back to Australia uh, for the COVID pandemic, but before that, we've been based mainly um, in Nikolopa and uh, Neahu, working with uh, Dr. Sila Malik at the Ministry of Fisheries on the Special Management Area Program. Um, so I was there for a year uh, doing that and then began my PhD, which was partly on looking at the impacts of the Special Management Area Program, which is a, a community-based marine protected area network that's expanding across Tonga. Um, and then also doing a status assessment of uh, Tonga's coral reefs. Sorry, there's a, a really bit of traffic at the moment. Um, so the first part of this project was really just trying to identify what the current status of Tonga's coral reefs uh, was. There wasn't much information um, on, on the health of, of the country's reefs as a whole. There have been bits and pieces that have been done, but we spent uh, three years uh, doing conducting ecological surveys across the whole country. So all of Vavao, all of Papai, and all of Tongatapu. And we now have data from uh, 350 sites across the country where we have uh, ecological information on the status of the reef fish fishery and also on uh, the coral reefs. Um, so these were benthic protoquadrats, which are uh, like the ones used um, for the Allen um, coral atlas maps. And so that was part one, was just, just working out what the status of the country's reefs really was. Um, and then from there, we started looking at what this means. Um, so this slide that I've shared um, starts to talk about some of the different outputs that you can use from these mapping projects. And I think using the, the Allen Coral Atlas is a really key way to start um, integrating ecological data into, say, monitoring, into um, management in particular as well. And I know Samoa has is, is it also called the Special Management Area Program over there? Um, it's, it's taken me a while to piece together what the programs are called in all the different South Pacific countries, but I've heard of some of the cool, cool work being done there. Um, but in Tonga, so what we were doing, we took the, the habitat maps. Um, unfortunately, at the time I started my PhD, we weren't able to use the Allen Coral Atlas because it hadn't been released yet. Um, so for Vavao, um, which is what you can see here on the slide. I actually had to go through and click in ArcGIS around every single reef habitat in the country and then manually identify what the um, habitat category was based on what it looked like when we were in the water. Um, and because the Millennium Coral Reef Mapping Project, which was similar to this but done in the early 2000s, just didn't have enough detailed information. Um, so if I had been able to use the Allen Coral Atlas right at the start, it would have saved me uh, weeks and weeks and weeks of work. <laughs> um, but now that that's, um, that's out, we can use it to do a bunch of things. So the first one, uh, which is on the top right of this slide, is we can now use those habitat maps to create other spatial layers. So we can take socio-environmental data. Sorry, there's a, a train going by. <laughs> Uh, one sec. It's a really big train. No worries, Patrick. <laughs> Thanks for making this work, even if you're in an unusual situation, location. Um, okay, anyways, I'll just speak a bit louder. So the one of the things we can do is actually use those benthic habitat maps to make other sort of maps. So we can integrate it with social environmental data um, to make maps of, say, fishing pressure. Um, so we took the Tongan National Census data, um, used that and a bunch of key informant interviews with fishers in Tonga to extrapolate fishing effort across the country's coral reefs, which of course couldn't be done unless we had 
the habitat data to extrapolate it on. And so now we now have spatial lay a spatial layer of fish and pressure for the entire country. Um, and we've also done this for uh, 15 other metrics. So we have one for wave energy for the country. We've done it for, we have a population density metric for the country's coral reefs um, and a whole bunch of different things like that. And the first thing you really need is that, that habitat data. Um, the second one um, is you can actually use this work to look at the management areas of the country. Um, and this is something I think we'll be organizing another webinar with Dr. Siola Mali Mali and the fisheries team in the coming months um, to look at how we can roll out management areas, um, the fish habitat we need, the SMAs, and use the habitat data to, to maximize the benefit of, of these management areas. Um, and we released a report earlier this year on the status of the country's special management area program. And with, within this, we had maps of every single SMA in the country um, with information on the reef area in those, those zones, um, in information on uh, coral cover, things like that. And then this was also available in English and Tongan. So we were able to um, make this available to the communities. It's currently being printed. Um, and then the last thing that we were able to do with um, maps like this is actually look at the impact of, of these management programs. Um, so Tonga has, I think there's now over 50 special management areas in the country. Um, and we were able to go through all of these and conduct impact evaluations on whether or not they're working. So whether or not they're actually making a difference to fish biomass, to coral cover, to biodiversity. Um, and part of this project involved um, pairing sites based on the habitat, um, which of course we needed, needed data like this for. And then the last thing as well is we can use maps like this to make predictive tools to try and model the potential recovery um, or potential impact of new management areas. So say in Tonga, if there's, there's communities that haven't yet implemented an SMA, we can take the habitat categories around those areas, around those communities, sorry, um, and try and extrapolate what the potential difference is going to be from making it a no-take zone or making it a um, special management area. Um, so those are sort of some of the, the ideas that we've had over the last few years on how we can use this data. Um, and I'd be really interested to see what other sort of ideas Scrap um, has uh, on some of this stuff. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much. And let me know if you have any questions on, on any of that. <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, if anybody has questions for Patrick, we can give his email and you can directly contact him. And we just really appreciate your storytelling and showing us how these Atlas maps can be used um, and are, are potentially being used in Tonga now. So appreciate it. And we'll continue on this storytelling of um, telling you a couple more user stories to maybe, you know, perk, perk some ideas to see how you can use um, the Atlas within your work. So we're gonna highlight about three stories. And because we've talked, spoken to dozens of reef practitioners, decision makers, and NGOs working on topics ranging from restoration to marine spatial planning and community engagement, um, here are a few of their stories. So first, the Atlas has been used to engage community and local, local stakeholders. I know some of us are maybe on the, on the line from Micronesia. Uh, one scientist from Dr. Peter Hauk um, is working there in an effort to create management plans his work is to monitor reefs, identify trends, and present to the communities to then decide where they want the locally managed marine areas or partial no-take zones to go. Uh, he states, the first thing everyone does is stick a big map on the wall. So that's what we start with. Right now, he's using static ecological data to make the analysis. Instead, he offers that the Atlas is an interactive tool to change things and create immediate feedback. Peter went on to say that sometimes we might have a GIS expert in Chuuk to do maps and meetings, but that is rare. Um, to have this tool and be able to export it, really what a cool thing. Uh, when we say export, as Joy mentioned, you can save and share saved areas. 
Um, so you can really communicate and collaborate like that. Then communities are able to give immediate responses to the coastal zone in question. Um, so by sketching a few examples, discussing scenarios and providing immediate feedback, he proposes that stakeholder meetings will be more effective and efficient. So for our next case study, we've also seen the Atlas support reef practitioners, um, such as Ridge to Reef, we've been talking about Vanuatu. Um, Jane Delavu works with the Secretariat of Pacific Community. They were wondering which coral reef areas are potentially vulnerable to runoff. Um, ideally, they want to identify watersheds and erosion projects that could be prioritized for conservation. Then apply a spatially explicit framework with scenario planning to identify the national priority areas. So they do this by linking the land drivers such as topography, rainfall, soil, and combining with the marine drivers such as current, bathymetry, benthic and geomorphic layers. What you see here is an example of a watershed in southern Vanuatu. In an effort to see how the land and sea intersect, a prioritization model with the Atlas's consistent data to map out potential sustainable aquaculture sites, such as TNC, the Nature Conservancy's uh, work that is also happening in Vanuatu. Uh, there's also reef rest seagrass restoration sites, such as Conservation International's work in Fiji and coral restoration sites such as Green Island Foundation is planning on in the Seychelles. So thus, the Atlas helps connect science to decision makers. So that brings us to our last case study and a wrap up of today's seminars and we're open for questions. Um, and probably these last two people are familiar names as well. At the moment, Hans Wendt and John Katu from the IUCN are using the Atlas maps to determine how much reef area is actually protected in Vanuatu. So a similar story to Patrick's, similar story to Patrick's reef uh, impact and evaluation. They hope to create new protected areas and once they analyze this data. And this is where there's a strong application for the spread community we see. The Atlas maps may be used as a base layer to start building upon countrywide strategy and action plans namely to identify seagrass and the coral algae areas, along with other geographical features that would be useful for planning and prioritization processes. Also, you are able to compare region by region statistics, which might be beneficial in the region that's so close and collaborative. And, um, and these maps are consistent again between countries, or the maps could be used for marine spatial planning in your local area. We also wanted to note um, after the devastation of TC Harrow, deeply sorry for everyone that was affected, we were able to supply the government of Vanuatu satellite imagery of the affected areas for analysis. Um, we did this with SkySat imagery that was um, at a finer scale and we hope that those communities are able to recover quickly and continue to benefit from the rapidly improving maps um, for their mitigation and planning processes in the future and to see what was affected. So hearts go out to them. Um, our, our goal wrapping up here is to support practitioners and managers like you um, to give you the tools and so here are some of the ways that we wanna do that and let you know the resources that you can utilize. Um, here we have our developing online courses with the, re, uh, the Nature Conservancy's Reef Resilience Network. Um, we're gonna provide training for reef practitioners on how to use the Atlas a little bit more in depth than we went on today and more background on remote sensing. So if you're interested in what you can actually do with these tools. And they will be available later this month. We're really excited to get in touch. So please, if you're interested, write yes in the ch chat bar um, now, and then we'd be able to connect with you later. Well, I see some yeses coming in. Thanks, guys. We'll, we'll be, for, be sure to connect with SPREP and let them know in the online courses. They'll be free. Um, and only a couple hours, so not too intense. <laughs> uh, although we are not able to have in-person workshops, we do plan to attend International Tropical Marine Ecosystem Management Symposium when it comes. And we're happy to be participating in the Pacific Nature Conference as well, although virtually. We can do what we can. <laughs> Lastly, 
Uh, we have tutorial videos to share with in-country partners and virtual teachings. And uh, we want to share with you our progress so far. I got a, we had a message um, when Kiribati would be available. So we wanted to let you know that larger regions such as the Eastern Africa, Western Indian Ocean, Hawaii, Northern Caribbean or other regions that are available now. This is a list of all the countries that are available in the South Pacific. Um, please, uh, I know we had what, a map out last year, but we've uh, our first version, but we've updated it since then from your feedback Back and with new depth data. So I really encourage you, um, as of September, we had a new Southwest Pacific layer redone. So I encourage you to look at it again and tell us what you think. Um, like Chris said, if you take an image, just circle the area in question or uh, what you wanna highlight and send us a little note. That's very helpful. And as we, so we are completing the rest of the world region by region. So if you have colleagues that are interested, please let them know that their region will be mapped soon. This is a, a map, uh, our little timeline, to give you an idea of when we're looking for data collection and map release. Please note we are still seeking data for Marshall Islands, uh, Line Islands, Kiribati, French Polynesia, and the Cook Islands. So if that team in Kiribati has some benthic data, we'd love to be able to use it and we can link you with the UQ team. Again, we do not, um, we only use this data internally. We do not publish it. It's just for the mapping effort. So if you have any submissions, please um, go to submissions at allencoralatlas.org. All the data helps with the accuracy of the maps and we'll definitely attribute you on the website. So much appreciated. Uh, so wrapping up, if you have a particular project uh, or proposal or a marine spatial planning effort in mind that you'd like to integrate the Atlas, please let us know and write in the chat box or send us a direct email. We would love to hear about your efforts. And hopefully you have now have a good idea of the Atlas and how it's made, how to navigate, and how your team might use it. So we encourage you to keep playing on the website, sign up for the newsletter to hear new updates and what's coming up next. Um, try out some of the downloads and, and write us with any feedback. We hope to collaborate with the SPRAP communities to reach your, to help reach your goals in the biological diversity, environment, and social economic areas. Thank you to everyone who has contributed data so much. It's so helpful. Our teams are ecstatic when they get data and given us permission to highlight their work. So kudos to everyone. Uh, thanks for listening and we hope to answer any questions you guys might have. Great questions back in the internet to everyone. Thanks. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, the team of the Allen Coral Atlas. We had a few questions. I think an important one was um, from Kiribati and, and probably the other countries wondering um, when the data sets or which data sets are available and when it will be available for the countries. But you, yeah, you gave us that full overview in the end. So um, I think that that question is definitely answered. Um, there Did you get a screenshot of that or does anyone need that again? Yeah, that, we can put that up again. Yeah, yeah, that would be good. Um, I think you will share your presentation with us anyway in the end and this entire, yeah, so for the people that are um, here or not here, so this entire presentation has been recorded and will also be shared um, through the SPREP network. So all SPREP staff will still have the opportunity to go and check out the recording of this um, presentation. But yeah, it would be good to, to share to share this or we could even put it on um, the portal. Because um, is that overview available on the website itself of the Allen Coral Atlas? Or I mean, do you mention on, on the website which data sets are coming available when? I don't we, oh, go ahead, go ahead Zoe. Um, I was just gonna say we don't actually put them online because they've kind of because of COVID they've switched so much that we didn't want to get anyone's expectations up. We do realize how informative and helpful that would be. I can tell you that we are expecting to have the entire world map by July 2021, and it looks like um, October 2020 is when some other Pap uh, Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands are gonna come out. And um, then, you know, the next in June and July, we'll have uh, Kiribati. So 
sorry, it's a, it's a little in the future, but you never know when those those uh, might change around depending on when we get data and how much we, data we have to create those benthic maps. Yeah, true. That's that's totally understandable with yeah these circumstances. But yeah, thanks for that. I don't think that we had other questions. I mean, Chris has done a, a phenomenal job in answering all those questions uh, in the chat directly. So thanks for that, Chris. Um, I don't think we have any more questions uh, unless someone wants to ask them now directly. Feel free to do so. Just un unmute yourself and um, you, yeah, please take this opportunity to ask um, your questions directly to the team while we have them in mind. Um, yes, I have a question. Thank you very much, um, Brianne and Zoe, Patrick, for the in very informative um, presentations. But I'm more interested in the reports. So the um, you know the final reports of all this um, uh, reef study and case studies and all that. Um, can we access those from anywhere? So I just had a visit to the to the website. It's not saying you know where we can um, get access to the reports, especially the ones um, you know on the Pacific. Oh. Um, yeah, I can try to answer that. Um, so in terms of the reports, we do, we don't necessarily generate reports about these locations, uh, but many have have come out. Um, so because they're not from our organization, they aren't necessarily posted on the atlas, but we can um, provide them to you if you're, are you referring to, uh, I know Patrick had some reports that he produced um, with the Tongan government. And I mentioned also the, um, the reports from uh, the IUCN from John Katu and Hans Wendt. Is that the report you're interested in? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's definitely possible for us to, uh, okay. I can certainly find those that Hans has sent to us. Yeah. yeah I'd be happy Available I can send publicly, the, um, so, yeah. SMA report as well, if you like. Sit. Yeah, maybe we could send the, the SMA reports and everything in a, a file when we send you the presentation as well. That would be great. Um, any also, other questions? Yeah. I also want to know if people are curious about their own country's reports. Um, I believe it would take a shape file to upload of your country, and then it would, you'd be able to do it on your own at the Atlas. I just wanted to note that the Atlas doesn't right now do countrywide reports just because the boundaries are um, some, sometimes not so straightforward um, as far as like EEZs and, and um, inshore country boundaries. So anyways, if you have your own country boundaries to upload, then you're, that's, that's able, you're able to do that on your own. Yes, yeah, so a GeoJSON or a KML file could be used. So you would upload that as a boundary and then complete that download step that I showed in the, in the demonstration. Um, that could also could be done for like a protected area. If you had a protected area boundary or even have them downloaded from another database, um, those boundaries also have the full download of the benthic and geomorphic layers as well as the imagery. Okay, thanks for that. And, and I think it's good to know for you that in the Pacific, we usually always use the EEZ boundary. So I would definitely, when you look into um, the Alan Coral Atlas in the future for people to download the, their own country data, make it uh, available within the EEZ. I think, um, yeah, the country boundaries are less often used. That's a really good point. Other, others have also suggested that that would be a more accessible like download feature. Yeah, yeah, and just just the last version of the EEZs that are, that is available on on um, the Marine Regions website. That's that's yeah, that's the reference point. Yeah, we'll definitely note that to our team. That's a great point, and good to know that all everyone follows the easy. Yeah. Well, so nice to meet with you guys, and such a pleasure. Yeah, I think we're going to wrap up. I don't think there's any more um, other questions. So yeah, we really, really want to thank you. So in name, in name of SPRIP, um, really want to thank you, Brianna, Zoe, Patrick, and also Chris um, for joining today and, and taking the time
um, to connect to us and, and to explain what the, the Alan, Alan Coral Atlas was all about. Um, yeah, I'm sure that everyone who tuned in today will agree that it was, was really interesting, really informative. Um, we learned a lot today and I'm, I'm confident that all the participants um, will now further explore the data or yeah, be um, impatient to wait until their data sets um, are available to start using them. Mm -hmm. and, and speaking of data, I also wanna thank you um, for sharing the data and making the data available because that's yeah not always, um, we cannot always take that for granted. So thank you for, for sharing the data and also previously um, the, the raw GIS files to do um, GIS analysis for the region while we were doing um, the regional state of environment report. So thanks for that. And as I said, um, everything is recorded. Everything will be available for the SPRIP community as a resource um, for the people who could not join today. So um, hopefully that will also answer some, some future questions if, if people have. And so yeah, thanks again. And um, we'll be in touch for follow-up and, and future questions. All right. Thank you so much, guys. <laughs> hey. Thanks, Brad. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Yep. All right. Bye. 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 See ya. See you in a month. <laughs> <laughs>